My story probably starts roughly about the age of six when I knew two things. Uh, firstly, that I was stupid and secondly, that I wish I'd never been born. Um, as it transpired, I had a number of issues which I didn't find out about for about 40 years later. Uh, and so this progressed. Uh, by the age of 18, I really didn't care. Um, I was a full-on punk rocker and hopefully I'd be dead by the age of 21 and that'd be the end of it. Um, it didn't happen. And so, uh, yeah, so I left school. I didn't go to university like everyone else did. Um, I trained as a bricklayer, worked on building sites, cowboy in Australia. And then I wanted to sort of get my act together and uh, rejoin society. So I joined the Metropolitan Police. And uh, I'm not sure if that's the best way to get your act together, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's one way anyway. So I joined the Met. I was in the Met for 12 years. It was, um, I had a great time. It was big industrial disputes. There was a miners dispute, whopping. Uh, Notting Hill was a no-go area, though he never admitted it. And uh, yeah, it was a really interesting time. But I still had this huge chip on my shoulder about being stupid. You know, in sort of like meetings, I felt less than, I didn't want to speak. Um, I didn't particularly like writing, I would avoid it. Um, I didn't like speaking on the phone because I couldn't see people's faces. So I'd literally walk round the police station for five minutes to find someone rather than speaking on the phone because I couldn't see people's faces. And then, uh, so I left the Met and I signed up for two postgraduate courses. So I was able to get the first degree because I had a lot of work experience. I did a postgraduate diploma at uh, Westminster Business School, I got distinction, and then I did a master's degree in international finance, trade and shipping at Cass Business School, and I nearly got a second distinction. It wasn't quite that easy. Um, so during, the, during those two years, I developed a whole load of techniques for learning information. And I literally used myself as a guinea pig. And so virtually every day I would try the technique, I would then look at what worked, what didn't work, and then continually perfected it. But what I still didn't know at this point that I was dyslexic. So what happened was, and it was a complete nightmare, is I'd get a piece of coursework, and on the master's degree, we were getting coursework every week and had to be produced and turned around within 10, 10 days, two weeks. So I'd get a piece of coursework, I would look at it, and my mind would just like, as it always did, would just go completely blank and I'd have this sort of nauseous feeling and it would last for about 24, 48 hours. And at some point I had to get my act together to do it. Also what I didn't know at that time is I'm bipolar. So the two worked in tandem. So I got a piece of coursework, my mind would go blank, I, I couldn't do it, I was stupid again. And then every time this happened, I crashed. And this went on for two years. It was a complete nightmare. But by the end of it, you know, I got a distinction. They said it was one of the most remarkable things they'd ever seen. But ironically, I felt more stupid at the end of my master's degree than I did at the beginning, because I was completely burnt out. Um, I then went into the city, and by this time I knew, and I couldn't really understand why. So my master's degree, I took one day off every two weeks. I worked 12 hours a day, and I did that for a year. And a lot of people working like six, seven, eight hours. And I couldn't understand why I needed to work 12, 14 hours to their six to eight hours. And now I understand that it's just a natural process that if I want to learn something, I have to probably do time and a half to double time compared with other people. Um, I then worked in the city for a bit. Um, I was going to go and work in China because I learned intermediate Cantonese and Mandarin. Um, but one thing led to another and a friend of mine said, well, can you help me manage some information? You know, he just joined Credit Suisse and I said, yeah, sure, using the techniques that I developed. And so it went, I imagine I just popped round to his house, but it ended up that I went to do a pitch at Credit Suisse and I got the business. So I quickly, you know, made some business cards, you know, I did some letterheads and I sort of, I didn't even have a course at this point. So then I had to put a course together and I'm, Again, I see it part of the dyslexia, part of the bipolar, is I was really OCD. I had to get everything right, and it was like a protective mechanism. Um, anyway, I delivered the course, it went well, and that was the start of my business. But what I started with was mind mapping about in 93, 
made a big difference, but I realised actually there were elements of it that didn't really work. And I started to improve it. And so by the time I got to Credit Suisse, I'd made a lot of improvements. But what actually drove me, so I knew all this worked in education. I knew that because of my own performance. And I was able to come out of lectures and other people coming out saying, what was that about? And I was thinking, well, it was obvious what it was about. This was a three-hour lecture, so that's where I'd got to. But what I didn't know, did it work in business? But also, because I had this chip on my shoulder, I had to prove myself. And, like, and also, I'm highly competitive. So I wasn't going to muck around with companies with 10 people, with 1,000 people. I had to go for global companies. You know, companies that are one-man band, you would think, well, how are they going to get in there? And then when I got into those companies, I'd try and find this mythical person who was more intelligent than me. I'm yet to find them. But what that did was drove what I developed, which is called Smart Wisdom. And I was constantly pushing myself. So it reached about, so I'd been doing it for about 10 years and I decided, well actually, if I want to really take this global, which I wanted to do, I needed to get it scientifically assessed to see if it worked. So I employed a team of cognitive neuroscientists um, who told me up front that they would say it as it was, so if it didn't, even though I was paying them a, a fortune, that if it didn't work, it didn't work. So I did the first test and what they found was that in a meeting or presentation scenario, most people who are taking notes who are non-dyslexic, their average real-time understanding is about 64%, which is okay. Smart Wisdom users, within two weeks, their real-time understanding goes up 12%. So straight away, they've got a substantial competitive edge. But after a year, it goes up 20%. So it goes from 64% to 84%, which is a game changer. So that means you can go into any meeting on any topic and get up to speed real time and be able to come across more proficient, more confident, etc., etc. So then I thought, because I knew one of the scientists was going to America, and I thought to myself, well, actually, this is a bit of an opportunity. Why don't I just see if it helps people with dyslexia? And then I thought, maybe I should get tested, because a few people have said to me in the intervening years, maybe you're dyslexic. So I was sort of 47 at this point. And so the study kicked off, and I phoned up the Dyslexia Association, and they said, yeah, come round, and I met Cheryl. And she was very nice and very charming, and I sat there, we chatted, and I sort of said what I did, and she said, oh, that's interesting. And she gave me all these papers, and I was sitting there thinking, well, I don't know, you know, I've developed all these strategies on how to manage information. Now, if I use those strategies on these tests, therefore, she won't find out if I'm dyslexic or not. And I had this conversation going into my head, actually bonkers, for about like two minutes. And I thought, just shut up, Jonathan, and get on with the test. So I did it. And about 30 seconds later, I was reading this question and bang, I was there again, 14, sitting in the exam, not being able to do anything. And I had tears coming up. So I'm a 48-year-old man sitting in front of this, you know, dyslexia assessment, about to cry because I couldn't answer the question. And she said, don't worry about it, you know, just relax. And I just thought, this is, you know, crazy. So I, I relaxed and then this happened about three or four times. And by the end of it, she sort of did the, did the scores and everything and said, well, I'll give you a better feedback later on. Um, well, her feedback was very good at the time, but obviously it was amazing later on. And she said, you are dyslexic. And I didn't believe her. Like she said, but she said, I'm not going to let you, go. and I, she must have read my face. She said, I'm not going to let you go until you, you know, you are able to understand that you are dyslexic. And, um, and I think after about an hour, eventually I sort of, I thought, okay. And so at the grand old age of 48, I finally found out why I was dyslexic. So I had no chance at school. I mean, zero chance. And so at 48, I found out I was dyslexic. And actually at 41, I found out I was bipolar. So you combine the two, you know, it was actually, um, it was a little bit of a challenge. So time went on, I carried on with my business and we had the scientific studies done. The really interesting thing was for dyslexics, the percentage improvement of real-time understanding was 
So average people without dyslexia, their real-time understanding in a complex meeting or presentation is 64%. Using smart wisdom, dyslexics, their real-time understanding went to 87%. I mean, it's a game changer. And not only that, their confidence was higher than non-dyslexics and their ability and their belief in their ability to manage information was higher than non-dyslexics. So it's like transformational. Um, what was interesting for me, it was only when I was about 53, finally, I thought to myself, I don't have to prove myself anymore. 53. And I just thought to myself, you know what, I'm not stupid. You know, I'm not any better or any worse than anybody else. I'm just me. And uh, it was no big thing. I can't remember why it happened, but it was just, but it was internal. Um, I still have moments, you know, which are challenging. You know, I accept the fact that my memory is shite. I think that's a northern term for shit. Um, you know, it's appalling. You can ask me to do something. And within about three seconds, I'll have completely forgotten it if I don't write it down. I double book the whole time. I had a good friend recently who I was driving her bonkers because she had a phenomenal memory. And she said, well, you said this last week. And I said, did I? And she said, well, you said this last week you, and you said that last month and you said this two months ago. It doesn't make sense. I couldn't even remember what I said yesterday. So I know my short-term memory is a challenge. Um, I know that, you know, listening to things for me, so reading is a challenge, but not that much so, but also listening for me is a challenge. So if somebody talks about something that I can't put my hand, hands on it, my, it scrambles my brain. It's like a sort of fuzzy television. Um, and I had an occasion recently, and I've never had it before, where I was with some person, and they would be talking about something on one track, and then they'd start a conversation on another track. And then they'd start asking me about words that I was using as I was answering this one. And then they would switch to this. And I've never experienced it before. It completely fried my brain. But a lot of it was because of the dyslexia. So where am I now? Um, I'm pretty comfortable with myself. You know, I'm still dyslexic. I'm still bipolar. You know, I have to manage it. I know that I can't do too many projects at once. I think three, three projects is about right for me, ideally about one. Um, focusing on one thing at a time is right for me. And I know I can't do two things at the same time. I can't listen to music and read. I can't, li I can't listen to someone and drive. It's just, I just, that's just the way it is. Um, where I've got to within my business is that so bearing in mind at school, you know, I was stupid. You know, the headmaster of one school walked past me and I was helping someone else. And this, I was about nine or something. And he just looked at me and said, the blind leading the blind. So that's where I've come from. I would be happy now, using smart wisdom, to go into any company in the world, to meet any CEO in the world. And I know within one space of one hour, I don't need to know what their issue is or what their business is. If they have a problem, I know with absolute confidence that I can help them think through it. It's really easy. And the reason I know that is because I know they're human and I know they have a short term memory. And that is roughly about, well, people say seven plus or minus two. Actually, I believe it's closer to three to five. Remember three to five action points. Now using smart wisdom, I can, I can have access to 20 to probably 50 points. So I can go way beyond any CEO or anybody else and, that's, and I can link it all together and that's how I can add value. And it's really easy to do. Um, Cheryl's been a great help. We've been good friends. She's consulted for me. She's given me advice. She's given me feedback. She's driven me bonkers at times because she's spotted <laughs> things that I haven't. And she said, Jonathan, you're too analytical. Be softer, you know, just be more. And I'm thinking, no, I want to be analytical and I want to, you know, and she says, no, just chill out, you know, be more relaxing, be more human, you know, be, you know, warmer. Um, and she's been a great, great help. Uh, the book she's written makes complete sense to me. You know, it's funny, almost as old, the older I get, the more I, I see how dyslexia affects me in my day-to-day -day work. And now also how to manage it. So I tell people, you know, do not rely on me to do something. If you want to, me to do something, 
remind me. You know, if you think you've got a meeting with me, you know, feel free to sort of say, Jonathan, we've got a meeting. So a friend did it yesterday, I'd completely forgotten. And in fact, if he hadn't reminded me, I wouldn't have been where I was supposed to have been. Um, so what I like about Cheryl's book is that it is about practical strategies that, you know, ourselves as sort of mature people can actually follow. Um, and uh, for that reason, I think it's a cracking book. On the same way that I think Cheryl is a tr cracking person, and I'm rather fond of Daisy too. <laughs> so on the, on the final note of Daisy, who's about to eat her water wipes wrapper, um, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, if you want to have a chat with me afterwards. Um, Well, as an ex-police officer, I'll just headbutt them. <laughs> Either that, or I'd stick my fingers up their nose and then headbutt them. Um, no, I think... So I, I have two things going on. I've got the bipolar and I've got the dyslexia. So I'm a, with the bipolar, when I crash, I will, just, I will basically just be on my own. And only... And because I had, I was so long without it being diagnosed, I used to be able to put up with hell. So it's really difficult, I think, for someone, it's really difficult for someone to appreciate if they haven't got it. I mean, one of the analogies I give, I used to have this like constant, it was like storm in my brain, sort of combination of storm, uh, ranting, just negativity. And I imagined that the only way I could stop it would be to walk up to a plate glass window, headbutt it, and then slam my brain on the jagged edges and grind it in. That's the only way I could imagine stopping this sort of nightmare in my head. So it wasn't too bad. Um, but when I was in the police, and actually when I worked in the city, and when I, you know, generally, if enough adrenaline was pumping, I could survive an hour, two hours, but then when I went away, you know, come back again. Did anybody exploit that? It did affect my career. You know, people would say that I was moody, which obviously I was, um, and that affected it. Um, yeah, so I guess it did. On the dyslexia front, did people, so, you know, if I start at school, I was really on a hiding for nothing right from the outset. So, you know, I come from a very privileged background. You know, I was supposed to go to Eton, Cambridge, and I don't know, go and do things in the city or, you know, whatever else I was supposed to do. Go and sit in the House of Lords and all that stuff. So I come from a very, very privileged background, but I failed my common entrance to Eton. I was the only one who failed their common entrance. So um, that wasn't a great start. You know, by the time I was 18, I mean, really, it was, the whole thing was just a non-starter. So the dyslexia really impacted me. And it So did, your question's really interesting. Did people take advantage of the dyslexia? I would say no. But did they take advantage of the consequences of dyslexia? I wouldn't say people took advantage of it, but it really impacted. So the lack of confidence, you know, I'd never sort of say stuff because I was always worried about what people would think or whether it was sensible or whether it was intelligent. Um, and then I'd sort of hold back. You know, I remember instances in the police where I, I was a sort of straight down the line copper, you know, I wasn't and this was in the years where things weren't quite straight down the line, but I was completely straight down the line. 
and I wouldn't say anything, but suddenly, you know, if I push came to shove, I'd explode. So it was only when I was put under extreme pressure that I'd then say, this isn't right. Um, and, you know, in my police reports, they would say things like, I can't remember the phrase they used, that I was aloof. Um, that, yeah, aloof was a common one. But it was basic, I didn't really sort of talk to anyone. Um, yeah, so it, it did impact. But not because they knew I was dyslexic, it impacted because of the consequences of dyslexia. Would you say, um, would you say that, they, that people would be more likely to exploit the bipolar blindness, say, because they have disability, things like that? Like, or say, using them for the reasons, I guess. Well, funny enough, I think. You see, I'm really high functioning. Yeah. So. The reason I ask is because you do seem like you're really, really straight down the line. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I am. Uh, I'm amazing, yeah. good looking, amazing, <laughs> modest too. Yeah, no. Yeah, so interestingly enough, I'd say the dyslexia impacted me more in the workplace. Um, but it was this lack of confidence and lack of belief. And that, interestingly enough, it only really shifted about three years ago. So my grandfather was highly accomplished, you know, he was chairman of, you name it, BBC, Midland Bank, Harland and Wolf, you know, and I used to compare myself with him. I had no chance. Um, but he, he was, he was, you know, he was given a peerage, um, sat in the House of Lords, but I'm not a corporate man. I'm not a civil servant, I'm an entrepreneur. No wonder I felt out of sorts. No wonder, you know, it was driving me bonkers. And actually, I have an opportunity now, you know, to take smart wisdom worldwide and make a difference to millions of people, like millions of people, um, whether dyslexic or not. So, but the thing that changed me was, it's a bit of a side story. Do you mind if I tell them? So my father died. I mean, we were worth a lot of money. And there's a classical thing of um, you earn a lot of money, the next generation spends it, and the third generation loses it. Well, we were a little bit special in that it was a fourth generation that lost it. And there was quite a lot left, and my father gave it to his second wife. And I challenged this, um, and I challenged the will. It went on for two years. But actually, funny enough, that challenging of the will, it was a huge risk. You know, it cost me 250,000. I was willing to lose everything because it was on principle. But that two years of fighting that and working with lawyers and realizing at a really deep level, and I was working with professionals, you know, in the civil service, in the tax departments, all sorts of people. And I really realized at a very deep level that people are just people. And actually, people you think should really know stuff, they don't. And that was a real eye-opener. And in terms of like confidence and self-belief, I came out of that process a different man. You know, I still have problems with the mental health. I will do for the rest of my life. Um, I still have problems with dyslexia. You know, I, I had this friendship recently, well, it was a partnership, which it couldn't continue because of the dyslexia. Um, so yes, the two impact me. I just have to be careful to manage them both. Yeah, and I think once you understand you have dyslexia, then it sort of takes a lot, and you understand the impact. So one thing I never realised is a lot of dyslexics join the police, join nursing, join the army, 
because they think it's all about people. What they don't realise, it's all about paperwork and occasionally you see people. So it's a nightmare. But apparently, and I didn't realise this, you know, and Cheryl was explaining all of this. So I think once you understand you have dyslexia, and so what was interesting from the previous speaker, his weaknesses are my strengths. So I'm really, really good at that holistic overview, the spatial awareness. I am shite at the things that you're good at. And it is, it is that mismatch. Um, you know, I wanted to do an MBA, and to do an MBA you have to do something called a GMAT, which is, you know, it's sort of English reasoning and maths. No chance. You know, I, I, would, I would read three of these re English reasoning, and by the end of it, the words are all swimming around. I've just... Then, I didn't realise it, now I do, you know, and that makes a huge difference. Um, and I think, you know, like the previous speaker, we know we can do things other people can't do. So I always imagined that everyone could see things at a holistic overview. Everyone imagined things as systems, which is what I do. Apparently, very few people do. But to me, it's just natural. You know, and like the, the previous speaker said, you know, like Cheryl sort of helps her clients, we do have these abilities. So I think the first step is to understand we do have them. Yeah, fuck it, it's a disability. I mean, being dyslexic fucked me from the age of, excuse my French, ex, you know, from the age of six through to, you know, you know, the age of 53. So what's that? Thank you. That's 47 years of believing I was stupid because of the dyslexia. So the impact is huge. Um, but once you, I think once we understand it, then we can do something about it. But I wouldn't say anybody directly took advantage of it, no. Either that or the mental health, no. And yes, I am very, you know, held together. And you're just seeing me on a good day, actually. <laughs> <laughs>